So good afternoon everybody, welcome to, the, welcome to our third panel, The Minorities Mirror, the core tension of exclusiveness and inclusiveness. And without much ado, I will give uh, the word to Luke March from the University of Edinburgh. Okay, thank you. I can't top that previous discussion, unfortunately. Um, mine's, a, mine's rather anomalous on the face of it, in terms of I'm focusing on the radical left, or so-called radical left. Also, the title that I have, I've stuck to the original title. This is very much a work in progress, and we've kind of deviated a little bit, as we'll see, from the question of democracy. We hope to bring that back in, and I can certainly bring it back in in questions. But I need to give a big shout out to my co-author, uh, Vincent Bain, of uh, uh, University of Rennes. Um, it wasn't originally supposed to be co-authored, but I spent the summer trying to dive through the uh, literature on Podemos, and I got myself very frustrated about some of the directions and found some of the directions I wanted to go already covered. So we came up with something we hope is going to be different. But um, it is a very much a work in progress, and that also explains the fact that it's, it's a little bit verbose, and I'll try and do it a, a, as quick as I can with that in mind. See, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of text. Our focus fundamentally is on the the notion of a movement party, which has been um, it comes from uh, classic discussions. Kitchell, 2006. It's been used particularly to describe a new generation of parties which emanate from social movements, have social movement characteristics, um, and are some kind of hybrid going forward. Uh, and they've been seen as some of the major parties, uh, anti-austerity, including uh, Cinque Stelle in, um, in Italy. Also, there's movement parties at the far right. What we found, I think, is that people don't really deviate from the, um, the Kitschel definition. Uh, there's a lot of comparison of like for like, and we kind of wanted to go beyond that. Um, and we, um, beyond some core characteristics uh, of what we say is hybridity and transience. Um, movement parties are seen as hybrid movement parties, but what does that mean? That means they take on movement characteristics. They're also seen as fairly short term. What, again, what is short term? They're not supposed to last forever. They might last, last a reasonably long time, but eventually they may or may not become uh, genuine parties, and that's something we wanted to look at. So we adopted a framework uh, which is provided by Piro and Gatinara for focusing on uh, actually Jobbik um, in Hungary. For, uh, in terms of identifying three core characteristics that we're going to look at. To, to, to look at, are these are, are certain parties, movement parties, what are the core characteristics? How are these parties changing over time? So it's about formal internal organization, informal decision-making processes, including those overlap, and external mobilization, i.e. how they interact with the movement realm. What we should expect from that literature it's, it's very much derived from Kitschel, is that internal organization should be informal. Um, no formal definition of membership role, uh, a kind of spotty kind of national coverage, very much kind of fluid uh, things, uh, rhizomatic things like movements. Decision-making processes should also be fluid. Maybe they have the dominance of a single charismatic individual, that that's seen more as a propensity of the right in Kitschel's original um, definitions. And in, ter in terms of external mobilization, they should, and again, this is open to definition, but they should they should be involved in the kind of movement-like contentious politics, um, kind of extra-parliamentary activism, as well as normal political engagement, such as um, kind of uh, inculcating membership. We have three parties. You might, some people might have identified the, um, the logos at the beginning. Uh, Podemos uh, from Spain, La Consensus is indomitable, unbowed France from um, France, and Bloco de Esquerda or Left Bloc from Portugal. We uh, incorporate the first two as they're seen in the literature as kind of classical movement parties, um, flexible informal party organization, and although it's debatable whether to the degree to which they come from movements or at least co-created, they involve harnessing movement activity and kind of having some of those kind of repertoires. We, we bring in Bloco de Esquerda as a kind of control case because it comes from a different generation, it's been around a lot longer, it's been more stable. Everyone has to mention the P word. It's not seen as, popular, but as populist. The, the, the former two are seen as classical left wing populist parties. Bloco de Esquerda is normally not seen as such. So, is it something fundamentally different? Has it learned from those parties? Is there a new form of party organization? That's kind of what we're focusing on. Our methods, are, um, again, and with um, 
with due recognition for Vincent here, just, this is kind of based on his ongoing PhD. So extensive work, particularly in uh, the former two parties. We've looked at party documents, uh, formal documents, and, and interviews as well. What we haven't done is, is as yet transferred this to uh, Blocker de Skirda. So that's, that's much more tentative and focusing on um, uh, secondary literature. So what I, what I do is take those three realms and apply them to each party in uh, turn and see where we get. So in terms of internal organization, um, Podemos was seen as a kind of archetypal fluid organization to start with. You could just sign up you didn't have it via the website. It had forms of kind of uh, internal plebiscitarian democracy. But that's really no longer the case. Again, this is what uh, Vincent's work is, um, is focusing on. As of 2020, you have a formal um, division between an activist and a member, and you have paid membership like almost any other party. And again, after the, the, the initial phase of loose local coalitions, you have the emergence of a kind of a broader territorial network, and like other parties, professional staff and physical infrastructure. For La France Insoumise, um, it's still in the, that kind of movement phase. Um, it doesn't really have a formal organization as such. It's very leader-centric. You still can just register online. Um, it has no statutes, has no internal uh, formal politics. Uh, according to its leader, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, it's a gazier, a gaseous, gaseous organization, fluid, rise of matter. But it's a kind of anti-party organization. It causes an awful lot of confusion to a lot of its um, local organizations. Uh, Bloco is a kind of mixed bag. Initially, it started off as a kind of green organization, um, bottom up, um, kind of what we see, see as, uh, as a, describe itself as a movement party, a kind of polyarchic decision making that's decentralized, avoids a form, still avoids a formal leader. But in fact, you can identify processes whereby it becomes a lot more organized throughout the period. Again, membership, rights, and duties involve a kind of formal set of rights and responsibilities and fees, um, increasing emphasis on local institutions. And even though the membership, the leadership is not actually mentioned, as of roughly 2005, <laughs> it has a political committee and a kind of first among equals leader, the national uh, coordinator. And it's worth saying it's also a policy seeking party. It's orientated on government from an early period. It has very complex manifestos, probably longer and more complex than many other more established parties. So there's a, there's a formalization of its, its um, infrastructure. In terms of the informal decision making processes, um, again, Podemos starting from this kind of open, democratic, digital, uh, digital model has become a very complex organization, 83 pages of written statutes, um, a kind of process of orientated organization of documents uh, submitted to members' votes. So rule guidance from the institutionalized, local branch representatives uh, who take decisions for the party like most other parties, but still some kind of path-dependent, origin-dependent um, uh, kind of features of instability, uh, and the leadership as being uh, um, a factor here in terms of charismatic leadership of uh, Iglesias um, and who still exercises some, some influence behind the scenes. When we turn to La France Insoumise, uh, Vincent puts it better than me, there's no internal democracy at all. <laughs> it's, it's again, it's, it's a complete contrast. Um, no <coughs> official statutes, 11 general principles, no functions for internal decision making or, or leadership accountability. It's, a, 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 it's confusing for local organizations. They don't know who, they have a wide, wide, um, wide amount of autonomy, but they quite often don't know who's actually supposed to speak on behalf of the party. Mélenchon is, um, takes decisions, runs for presidency without any consultation with the wider party. In fact, it's, worth, it's, it's still broadly true that the organizations orientated towards his presidential leadership bit. Uh, Blocco, um, formed by three factions who have some kind of informal dominance still. A leadership issue at the center, the emergence of a dominant leadership, then joint leadership which didn't work, and now a first among equals leadership, um, a kind of oligarchic leadership, 
Again, it has a permanent committee which elects that leader, um, not mentioned in statute. So some informality, but also some regularity. Um, relative to the others, it's pluralist, uh, it's non plebiscitarian more participative with, with some problems caused by the um, prevalence of internal factionalization, prone to party splits and support rising upwards to 10%, downwards to 4% uh, with offshoots. Um, external mobilization, again we talked the, the, the co-creation of party and movement at the beginning has changed to something a lot more complicated. Uh, a lot of the original most dramatic um, movements in Podemos' creation have faded. Uh, there's still commitments to supporting, um, uh, supporting uh, um, movement initiatives, uh, but arguably some of the most ambitious have faded. There's still the, the participation of social movement leaders on party lists. Uh, and again, uh, Vincent's done some work on local level. Certainly when you talk about the grassroots, the mem the, there's a real, still a strong movement party overlap, uh, but not in the higher echelons of the party. La France Insoumise, still a much stronger movement emphasis, a symbolic financial physical engagement in contentious politics. That means they, they stand as a movement party, they finance, the, the activists uh, finance uh, movement initiatives, uh, and they participate quite regularly in movement initiatives. Albeit some of the most uh, ambitious projects have maybe faded, but still a kind of overlap um, amongst the party hierarchy and local level between social movements and the party. With, uh, with Bloco, again, leadership and membership overlap from the outset. Uh, an openness still to, to for party working groups to non-members, non-party groups. Um, and even a um, de facto position which cooperates with social movements. The party within the Portuguese um, political context has always acted as a kind of opinion former for contentious social issues. Um, albeit often in cooperation with other parties, um, things like same-sex marriage, cannabis decriminalization, laws against domestic violence, that kind of thing. Very weak in the, in the um, trade union movement, that's, that's kind of co-opted by the Communist Party, uh, but you can still say it's a, 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 okay, at a local level, it's a movement party. Um, moving towards kind of rounding these kind of things up, um, like I say, this is tentative, but we have these three aspects of organization, decision-making, and external mobilization. La France Insoumise in the middle still fits what the picture I to talk about as a, a classic movement party. Informal organization, charismatic, perhaps authoritarian leadership, and a sustained emphasis on social movement. The other two organizations are becoming more formalized political parties. Um, they have external commitments to movements. But it's difficult to distinguish this from the radical left more generally, which um, habitually talks about um, its cooperation with the extra parliamentary realm. So where that kind of leaves us, um, thinking towards the theory of movement parties, we think at least we're going to need to look at subtypes thereof. Uh, Podemos is plebiscitarian, i.e., it has it has some. It has a strong leader, a charismatic leader, but internal processes whereby the, the membership is consulted, usually in ways which, um, which end up supporting leadership uh, decisions. And digital democracy tends to be low, uh, low rates of participation and, and uh, <coughs> high support for initiatives of the leadership. La France is, is to be as charismatic, so authoritarian in terms of a leader, untrammeled by any, any particular internal democracy. And Bloco as a grassroots democratic along the lines of a traditional green um, um, and a left libertarian party. Again, we, we may be looking at, at Podemos and Bloco as um, more parties with movement linkages and genuine movement parties. Um, and Bloco, as, uh, particularly since it talks about uh, uh, being an eco socialist party, as more along the lines of, like I said, this traditional left libertarian party. Um, Yes, there's a lot to say about the internal democracy of Podemos and, and the promises of populism and how those have not been fulfilled, but at least it has them, whereas La France to me doesn't, doesn't have those um, kind of elements at all. As I said, it's kind of a work in progress, so we ended up with some questions that we're still puzzling with. What's the cut-off? When does the movement parties just become a party with movement aspects? 
again, it just becomes part of the radical left, which um, relative to most other party families still has this ethos of being a part of the wider movement, whether in, rhetorically, whether in fact it actually fulfills this as separate. How are those, how are those factors uh, relevant? What are the relevant factors in the transition? Decline of social movements, uh, the decline of populism as a left-wing populism as a relevant, uh, attractive model. Um, and another thing which actually links back, in concluding, links back the uh, presentation to the kind of broader questions of uh, democracy and liberalism. Whereas in general, the left-wing populists are seen as more inclusive, less illiberal, certainly the, the populist element as it transpires into organizations seems to uh, it, uh, it imply a greater degree of internal illiberalism and lack of democracy. And it's not perhaps surprising that the most democratic participative party is Blocker, which is the least populist. But that's just for uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, next we will have Gulna uh, Sivka Tulina from the University of Amsterdam telling us about opportunism or ideological convergence and speaking of strange bedfellows, these are pretty strange. So the 15 minutes is yours, I will put my signs here. Thank you so much and uh, first of all I wanted to really shout out to uh, the previous panel presenters who already set up a scene uh, to talk a little bit about the fringe movements and masculinity and how these aspects are also influencing uh, political structure today. And um, the research that I'm presenting is part of a bigger project where I do look at how, contrary to what we're used to, uh, where far right is very much using the other communities as uh, the other in order to construct their own identity, I look at the movements and the groups where actually what we will call uh, center right or far right movements do appeal to other communities to actually gain some support and gain some uh, extra fellowship. And in this case, we can differentiate several groups and several trends. And the first of all is indeed the more fringe movements on the far right sector or the alt right. And it's most of the time we need uh, connected to the internet sphere. The nanosphere was also mentioned here before, where we do see that some of the groups go actually further in their critique of Christianity, but not to neo paganism, but more to Islam, where do they they say that Islam is actually the um, conservative, the masculinity-centered religion. So therefore, uh, there is indeed ideological um, convergence between some of the groups also among the Muslim extremists or Muslim conservatives. And then you do have the terms like white Islam or white Sharia, where you can already guess that the whole understanding of Islam is very much mediated one, where indeed the rights of the women are suppressed and the masculinity of the male uh, is the center of the family or the community. Uh, but also in terms of indeed uh, democratic norms, for instance, that they will be speaking more in favor of a caliph or a king. So it's not so much about the democratic representation, but more about having a male a representative of the elites at the top of the whatever political um, formation uh, you would like to have. In this case, in the internet is of course uh, one area where we do see this convergence, but another one will be related more to the emergence of the Islamic State, where you do see that some of the uh, representatives of far right or neo-Nazi communities actually converted to Islam and joined ISIS to fight there, and ISIS very much also used them as these uh, figures and in their advertisement campaign showing that this is truly international movement. So you do see uh, this converges on the fringes, but I would argue it's not only with something that we do on the, on the smaller, lower uh, scale, somewhere in the depths of the internet, but actually also in very much center, center right uh, spectrum. And here we do have official institutions, and since my work mostly focuses on Russia, Russia is one of the good examples where you see the Russian Orthodox Church as indeed one of the religious institutions that is connected to the state, cooperating together with Muslim uh, official institutions, or the Muftis, and together they create a block in defense of conservative traditional values. And at the same time, a lot of research has been done uh, about similar interactions also on the international platforms where um, what has been also called as Borka Baptist networks that will be cooperating together on the international platforms to block some of the leftist, in their opinion, uh, decision in favor of LGBTQ rights or indeed the protection of the family rights the way they define it. 
And finally, and this is what we need a little bit, what I would like to focus on today, uh, is more center, center right grassroots movements, uh, where you do see that on the one hand you have TikTok trends, where you would have in France women wearing a hijab just as a way to sort of play with it and to play with their feminist identity and maybe to define themselves more as a, um, a woman actually being in her full identity when she is shy and she, when she's subjugated to a man and sort of regaining their agency through the play with a hijab, although they are not Muslims at all. But also, indeed, as we do see now in the political spectrum, that some of the Muslim voter communities are actually joining the center-right or far-right uh, parties, uh, also because they think that they better represent their ideas and better represent their values. Um, so, indeed, in the majority, the main discussion about the interplay between far-right and Islam has been focused on the European Muslim question, uh, which can be traced already back to the 90s. Uh, where migration has been increasingly reframed in Muslim Islamic terms, that it's that most of the migrants are Muslims in their identity, so therefore there's an influx or growth of Muslim communities who are not integrating or have their issues of uh, bringing their families who are not educated. Um, and then, of course, there were several events that has triggered um, the securitization of this question. So it's 9-11 in the US, but also terrorist attacks in some of the European countries. But also, of course, the migration crisis of 2013 and 15, where a lot of um, Muslim refugees uh, fleeing the war in Syria traveled to Europe, and Europe was simply not prepared to deal with that amount of numbers. And in, in the, the mainstream far-right discussion, what we do see is that Muslim communities are incapable to integrate because their values <coughs> are incompatible with either liberal values or some, as we define, this Judeo-Christian civilization so Christian values, so therefore so that there is a constant problem of having them, but also in these more in practical terms there will be ideas about curbing migration or deporting legal migrants and refugees, but also in establishing security control. Um, just focusing on the Netherlands as a case, you do see several peaks where several parties of the far right spectrum very much gained unexpectedly a lot of support, so into some 20, into some two. It was the Pierre Fontaine, uh, one of the first who actually challenged the migration policies of the Netherlands. Then it had Kate Wilders, which is still in power, and he was quite um, popular in 2010. But also a newcomer, whom I will be discussing today, is a Forum for Democracy, which also gained a lot of support for uh, in the election for the Senate in 2019. So what happened to these parties is that with the first case, leader get assassinated, so parties stopped existing. Kael Twilles remained forever in opposition, although he tried once to co-govern uh, um, with, with other central-right parties, but for, actually get excluded, so he never joined it. And with Forum for Democracy, the, the party is sort of rethinking itself uh, because of several scandals that they experienced in the last couple of years. But what my argument is that being anti-Muslim for far-right uh, parties becomes a liability in the current situation. First of all, uh, as you already see, that some of them are too radical to be included into coalition. So they realize that forever staying on the anti-Muslim argument just keeps them in the opposition. It doesn't give them a chance to join the coalition because they otherwise they seem as too radical and too far-right. Another thing is that they have remained one issue party, so as soon as there are other crises emerge, they do not have usually some other ideas to offer to their voters base, so that the voters will be choosing other parties that are more representative of their interests at that time. But also, as the center moves to the right, um, some of their parties will be losing their votership because the others will just go to a more center right party. So in that sense, they also see that some of the, uh, their votership base it has been declining over the years. So what is interesting now uh, is indeed the case that I discussed what happened at the beginning of this year with the Forum for Democracy Party that all of a sudden, despite them being for ages since the beginning representing themselves as anti-Muslim, anti-migration, very much in favor of white male um, dominance, they changed totally their strategies and reached out to the groups that they before saw basically as the other. And here you see the leader of the party, Thierry Baudet, um, we were talking a little bit about the bodybuilders, so he indeed went on the TikToks to, to the gym with the bodybuilders that do identify themselves with the multi background, and he actually sort of tried to, to join them there, which was quite hilarious, but nevertheless great because of that, a lot of views. Uh, 
But he also went to a more central uh, YouTube channels that are run by Moroccan community, sort of to join them for cooking meals for Ramadan. Uh, and as you see already on the way he's standing, quite often he even kept the whole patronizing attitude and saying that when the presenter said, yes, I'm, um, I'm an, uh, a Dutch person so from the Netherlands, he said, no, 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 you're from Morocco, so you're Moroccan, I'm the Dutch. So he also, even in that public discussion, he still very much dissociated himself from the Muslim community. But nevertheless, and here you would see a small maybe Twitter, or now X, uh, channel that was actually saying the Muslims are in favor of Boday. So it has been quite a real uh, support, gain uh, real support. So why this is happening, and my argument is indeed one of the things that the two sides join in common grievances, because both the Forum for Democracy but also Muslim communities are excluded from the representative uh, mainstream parties. So in that case, they do have a common enemy, the elites, and in this sense, a cultural elites, cultural center left, that also has been critical towards Muslim for the last couple of decades. Um, also speaking of indeed the cultural uh, aspect of it, of course, the whole discourse is quite anti-feminist, uh, but also it reinforces the masculinity image. And here, uh, Islam is not only about indeed being a strong man, but also just being a rebellious. So the whole aspect of Islam is not so much a religion, but as an embodiment of a protest. And finally, it's of course uh, very much using this whole anti-LGBTQ discourse as indeed Forum for Democracy has been very much outspoken about it and they sort of find allies um, in this among Muslim communities who also very much speak in favor of traditional gender roles and traditional family models. With the um, escalation of the situation in Israel and Palestine, this is of another aspect where anti-Semitism or Forum for Democracy joins pro-Palestine um, agenda of the Muslim community. So in this case, anti-Israel sentiment has different roots, but it's still in terms of you know uh, embodiment, it very much again speaks pro-Palestine and anti-Israel. So since it's a work in progress, a couple of a couple of moments, indeed, that I would like to put here open the table and maybe did see uh, whether you guys could also help me think in these slides. Is it, it, I mean, it's a fringe, for sure. Uh, this is a very small group um, that by no means, I mean, Forum for Democracy has five seats out of 150 in the Netherlands today, but they probably were going to lose in the elections that are upcoming on, in November. But at the same time, what we do see is that this whole anti-LGBTQ and very much uh, anti-cultural left agenda has been hijacked by another party. So there was also a realization in the Denk party that used to represent Muslim communities but more center-left side. All of a sudden, they become center-right, which created a lot of confusion even among their constant voters because they're now like, okay, we don't know what our party stands for. But in their new program, they very much spoke anti-LGBTQ kind of discourse, uh, which again very much resembles what Bode did just like a couple of months before that. And another aspect is, of course, um, much of the analysis has been based just on the feeling um, and just indeed analyzing what kind of events are happening uh, in the Dutch, but also in the French uh, situation. But will be interesting to see in terms of numbers. First of all, indeed, how many Muslims actually support these groups? To, to what extent it's indeed a large or significant share of the population, which is quite often difficult to trace because not all the data that is on the elections actually records the religious backgrounds of the voters. But also you need to look uh, whether it's true that we do see that the far-right populist parties are also shifting now slightly to the center, maybe, and downplaying some of the anti-Muslim components, whether that's actually true and whether we can maybe try to quantify this process and maybe show that there is a trend or maybe lack of it. Um, but indeed on the last point, um, I think in the, in the general framework of this work, I would just would like to see and maybe argue in favor of looking at the Muslim communities as the participants of culture wars. Because quite often they seem as the side effect either uh, as an object that get attacked or just being pulled. But I think in the case indeed, of Western European democracies where Muslim communities have been there already for several decades, at this stage they are participants of the political uh, spectrum and they do have voice. And now we also see that the parties actually do come up with this. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And now uh, we will have the third paper. I am Courtney Blackington from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Courtney will talk to us about disgust rhetoric and protest against stigmatized minority groups. Great. 15 minutes. Um, so we know that far-right social movements around the world have used disgust rhetoric to stigmatize various ethnic, racial, um, and sexual minorities. By disgust rhetoric, I just mean rhetoric that projects disgust onto members of a group to stigmatize them. Um, we can think about language that claims that these group members are dirty, toxic, noxious, ill, decaying, etc. Um, as as uh, consisting of disgust rhetoric. To give you an example of this, uh, this is a uh, picture from um, an anti-LGBTQ plus protest in Turkey, which featured um, the slogan LGBT. Um, get your dirty hands off of our children here using dirtiness, right, as a way of projecting disgust. Um, and we've seen similar slogans um, stigmatizing LGBTQ plus people in countries like the US, Poland, Hungary, et cetera, right? Um, and when these far-right social movements use disgust rhetoric, it appears to be um, with a desire of mobilizing people to participate in these sorts of protests. Um, so in this article I ask, does it work? Right? Does discuss rhetoric actually mobilize people to engage in these far-right protests against groups' rights? Um, in particular, under what conditions does discuss rhetoric encourage individuals to protest against or in support of a group's rights? Um, so I theorize that discuss rhetoric may fail to mobilize people to engage in protests against groups' rights for two key reasons. First. Um, we know that there are always going to be some people, like socially progressive people, who do not support this type of rhetoric. Um, and actually among people who are opposed uh, or are supportive of these, this group's rights and opposed to discussed rhetoric, exposure to discussed rhetoric um, can increase support for a targeted group. It can make them um, kind of think that that group should have better access to rights, etc. Um, so among these people, they're probably not going to mobilize against a group's rights because they support that group's rights, obviously, right? Um, but moreover, it might backfire in the sense that discussed rhetoric may anger these socially progressive people who are opposed um, to it. Um, anger in the political psychology literature is a mobilizing emotion. It's been shown repeatedly that anger tends to increase people's willingness to protest um, and take other sorts of political action. Um, so for these people who hold positive or neutral views towards the targeted group, um, I hypothesize that discussed rhetoric um, exposure to discuss rhetoric will make those people more likely to protest in support of that group's rights. Um, and I also hypothesize that anger at the group that's using the discuss rhetoric is going to mediate that relationship um, between exposure to discuss rhetoric and being more likely to protest in support of that group's rights for those people who have positive attitudes towards the stigmatized group. So on the one hand, discuss rhetoric um, may backfire by mobilizing people who are opposed to it. But even for people who are potentially sympathetic to the claims embedded in the discussed rhetoric, even for these people who hold um, kind of more socially aggressive attitudes um, on the group that's targeted in the discussed rhetoric, discussed rhetoric may also demobilize. Disgust as an emotion in the political psychology literature has been shown to be a withdrawal emotion. It tends to encourage people to withdraw from the stimulus or the group that's making them feel disgusted. It encourages them to put physical distance between themselves and the object of disgust. Now on the one hand, um, being exposed to disgust rhetoric and feeling disgusted by that group that's targeted, um, kind of that sentiment making you want to put distance between yourself and the targeted group might not mean that you're going to be less likely to protest against that group's rights because you might not have to see that group at the protest. But at the same time, um, we know from the political psychology literature that disgust also discourages information seeking. So if you feel disgusted by a threat, um, you are less likely to seek information um, about that threat because you just don't want to think about it, it grosses you out, and you just want it to stop, right? Um, so I think that a kind of similar mechanism could happen here wherein people who do feel disgusted by the disgust rhetoric just don't want any further information about that group and therefore don't attend protests against that group's rights. Um, disgust as an emotion also increases social avoidance. Uh, people who feel disgusted don't want to be around a lot of people. You have to be around people to be at a protest, so they might not um, want to attend. 
Um, and then finally, um, some of the work that's looked at the effects of disgust on political participation uh, finds that it negatively correlates with political participation. So people who feel disgusted um, are less likely to sign petitions, for example. So we similarly, I think, might expect that people who feel disgusted by disgust rhetoric might not protest um, for these couple of reasons. Um, so my second set of hypotheses um, suggests that exposure to disgust rhetoric can make it less likely that people who hold negative attitudes towards a stigmatized group will protest against that group's rights, and that feeling disgusted by the disgust rhetoric will mediate that relationship, um, that negative relationship between exposure to disgust rhetoric and being willing to protest against that group's rights. So I test these hypotheses um, by looking at disgust rhetoric that targets LGBTQ plus people in Poland. Um, I focus on disgust rhetoric that targets LGBTQ plus people uh, for a few reasons. First, there's um, some literature in the US context particularly um, that suggests that disgust does impact people's perceptions of LGBTQ plus people. Some people are disgusted by them. Um, and it also shows that when people are disgusted by LGBTQ plus people, it tends to discourage them from supporting this group's rights to adoption um, or to um, have equal um, marriage access, right? Um, and so we know that this is a salient emotion um, in this literature. Um, moreover, we know that um, from, once again, the U.S. case, disgust rhetoric can have a backlash effect um, on this issue. So while disgust rhetoric does make some people feel disgusted by LGBTQ plus people, for others, there's an attitudinal backlash that actually makes people more supportive of LGBTQ plus rights. Um, I pick Poland specifically um, because disgust rhetoric has been frequently used by far-right social movements in Poland. Um, there is a um, stop pedophilia campaign that falsely claims that, dis uh, that um, LGBTQ plus people are pedophiles and in this way invokes disgust rhetoric um, against them. There's also a lot of other settings wherein this is used. Um, moreover, um, there's been some research that shows that where a state or a government is propagating and permissive of homophobia, homophobic individuals are more likely to participate. Um, at the time of the, the research, when the survey experiment that I'll describe in a minute uh, was fielded, the Law and Justice Party was still firmly in charge, um, and uh, they have actively propagated and permitted homophobia. Um, they've used anti-LGBTQ plus slogans um, and conspiracy theories uh, as they've tried to mobilize their base. Um, and we've seen these uh, repeated multiple times on um, state-led media outlets. Um, and so it's this context where uh, the government is, or was at least, um, propagating and permitting homophobia. In these sorts of settings, we see homophobic individuals generally participating more according to this cross-national literature. And what this might mean is that there might be lower social desirability biases to not report your willingness to protest against LGBTQ plus rights. Because um, if you're in a context that's permissive of homophobia and homophobic individuals are more likely to participate, there's kind of fewer desires to underreport that sort of behavior. So in that sense, it's kind of a strong test. Um, to test my hypotheses, I did a pre-registered nationally representative survey experiment um, respondents were asked a series of demographic, partisanship, and political participation questions. Um, I measured their pre-treatment measure um, of homophobia by asking the standard word world values survey question uh, where the order of the groups um, was randomized. Um, I understand this is not a perfect measure. The reason I chose to do it this way um, is because it uh, placed uh, LGBTQ plus people alongside a lot of other groups. Um, and so I thought it would minimize the introduction of pre-treatment bias. Um, I then, uh, respondents were put in either a control or treatment group where the control was just informed um, about a group of people protesting against LGBT um, rights and the treatment um, group was also exposed to the slogans that were used um, by these protesters, um, all of which invoked disgust rhetoric. Um, all of these uh, slogans that, that um, the respondents were told the protesters chanted are chants that prote protesters at anti-LGBTQ plus rights protests in Poland have used. Then respondents were asked a series of questions about the emotions that they felt directed at the protesters and directed at LGBTQ plus people. Um, and they were asked about how willing they would be to join a protest for LGBTQ plus rights if it happened near to them. Um, and their likelihood of joining a protest against LGBT ideology if nearby. 
Um, the reason that I use this language is because that's how the far right protesters organize people and mobilize people. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. And I'm also happy to talk about how I dealt with detention checks um, if you're interested. Um, so this uh, figure just first plots the difference and the mean likelihood for the full sample um, of being willing to protest for LGBTQ plus rights um, on top or against LGBTQ plus rights on bottom. You can see that for the full, full sample, uh, when people are exposed to discussed rhetoric, they're more likely to protest for LGBTQ plus rights, but less likely to protest against LG LGBTQ plus rights. So this offers some support for my first set of um, hypotheses. However, both hypotheses were conditional on pre-existing attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people. So um, if we kind of break these um, people into two groups, those that expressed a homophobic prior and those who did not, um, we can see that people who were not homophobic um, and who were exposed to discussed rhetoric are more likely to protest for LGBTQ plus rights, but less likely to protest against LGBTQ plus rights um, if they're not exposed to the discussed rhetoric. So discussed rhetoric does seem to mobilize people who hold positive pre-existing attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people to protest in defense of their rights. So this offers some support for HYA. Um, my, uh, and then furthermore, if we look at just homophobic people, um, we can see that exposure to discussed rhetoric does um, slightly increase their willingness to protest against LGBTQ plus rights relative um, to people who are not exposed to discussed rhetoric who are homophobic, but these effects are not statistically significant. Um, and so this offers some support for um, H2A in the sense that people who um, express homophobic attitudes prior to the treatment um, are not mobilized by discussed rhetoric. Um, I then look at the emotions that mediate this relationship. Um, on top, there's just the mediation path diagram that shows the um, relationship between um, exposure to discussed rhetoric, um, willingness to protest for LGBTQ plus rights, and then plots uh, anger at the protesters as a mediator. What we can basically see is that um, the positive relationship between being exposed to discussed rhetoric for non-homophobic people, and in turn being more likely to protest against or in support of LGBTQ plus rights, is mediated by anger. Um, so in other words, when non-homophobic people are exposed to discussed rhetoric um, about LGBTQ plus people, they do become slightly more likely to feel angry at the far-right protesters, and in turn, um, they are uh, kind of more likely to protest for LGBTQ plus rights. So there's a backlash effect that seems to be happening here. Um, here I show the uh, mediation path diagram again. Uh, this time it's for homophobic people uh, and their willingness to protest against LGBTQ plus rights. Um, if they were exposed to discussed rhetoric. So what this is showing um, is that uh, there's not a statistically significant relationship between being exposed to discussed rhetoric and being willing to protest against LGBTQ plus rights for homophobic people. But it is true that people who are exposed to discussed rhetoric and who are homophobic are slightly more disgusted with LGBTQ plus people, and they are the ones who are slightly more likely to protest against LGBTQ plus rights, though the effect size is really small. Um, so overall, what I seem to be finding here, and this is the first cut, um, is that discussed rhetoric seems to backfire. It tends to mobilize people to protest in support of LGBTQ plus rights, and the anger at the protesters seems to mediate this relationship. I further find that discussed rhetoric can weakly mobilize anti-LGBTQ plus protests, but really not much. It doesn't move the needle as much there as it does um, with mobilizing non-homophobic people to protest for LGBTQ plus rights. Um, and I find that disgust does mediate the relationship, um, between exposure to discussed rhetoric and being willing to protest against LGBTQ plus rights for people who are homophobic. Um, and this is somewhat um, positive in the sense that we do see discussed rhetoric backfiring when it comes to conventional protest participation. At the same time, though, it's important to note that discussed rhetoric can have other pernicious effects. It dehumanizes people. It often involves calls to violence. And so I think it's important to further look at the um, effects of discussed rhetoric on these non-conventional forms of political participation. Um, I'm working on that right now. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. And now we will move to our last speaker in this third panel, Roman Hlatky from the University of North Texas on revenge revisited the representation of ethnic minorities, resentment, and the radical right electoral success. Roman, the 15 minutes are yours. All right, good afternoon. Let me start by saying a big thank you to the organizers of this conference. Um, I'm very excited to be here and present 
uh, a co-authored project with Amy H. Liu at the University of Texas at Austin and two of our PhD students, Ariel Petre Young and Yin Hong Lee. So this project is motivated by the electoral success of the radical right. Here on the left panel, you can see the decade average of the electoral returns for radical right parties in Central and Eastern Europe, right? And as we see, the radical right has been getting more and more successful. And as we've talked about today, that's bad, right? Uh, the electoral success of the radical right has a host of bad consequences, ranging from the rights of minority groups, as we just talked about, right? <laughs> Sexual minorities, migrant minorities, ethnic and gender minorities. The radical right also leads to geopolitical reorientation away from Euro-Atlanticism, meaning away from the European Union and away from NATO towards Russia. And it also radicalizes the mainstream, right, which may pose the largest threat uh, associated with their success. We see Christian democracy, right, and social democracy are often radicalized when the main, or when the radical right succeeds electorally. And as we've talked about today, right, democratic backsliding is also often a consequence. Now, at the same time that we've been seeing the success of the radical right at the ballot box, we've also seen the representation and the mobilization of minority groups in Central and Eastern Europe, right? This includes ethnic minorities, right? In the form of ethnic minority parties, right? This includes Roma mobilizations, the Roma Lives Matter movement recently, and perhaps the most recent kind of salient minority mobilizations in Central and Eastern Europe concern gender and sexuality rights, right? Mobilization of pro-LGBTQ, uh, pro-female uh, empowerment movements. So the question we ask in this paper is what is the effect of minority representation on the electoral success of the radical right? And to answer that, we start with you know, a seminal work, at least something I consider a seminal work, and that's the work of Lenka Pushtikova, who proposes the minority grievance model. The minority grievance model states that societies have a historical hierarchical status quo. Historically, ethnic majorities were at the top of the societal structure in Central and Eastern Europe. Now, as minorities mobilize and extract policy concessions and resources from the state, this threatens to reverse or at least balance out the group-based hierarchy within societies. The reversal of this status quo, right, these threats to the ethnic majority position, raise grievances, be they cultural or economic, among segments of the ethnic majority. The radical right and the final step promises to curtail these gains of minoritized groups, leading to their electoral success by promising to put the ethnic majority, the dominant group, back at the top of the social hierarchy, the radical right appeals to the grievances that the majority holds against minority mobilization. And so the key mechanism here is resentment of status loss, right? Individuals from ethnic majorities are resentful about their dominant societal position being threatened by minoritized groups. Previous findings show us that ethnic minority vote share and coalition participation, right, so when an ethnic minority party participates in a coalition, a government coalition, at T minus one, that's positively correlated with radical right vote share at time T. We also know that radical right voters are less supportive of financial transfers to minority groups. And we also know that priming national identity produces support for minority transfers. So this is the evidence we have thus far about uh, the minority grievance model, or in favor of the minority grievance model. Now we think that there are a couple of gaps here uh, that we seek to fill in this paper. First, we want to make a clear distinction between descriptive and substantive representation, right? Thus far, this literature has treated coalition participation as substantive representation, right? The extraction of resources and policies that benefit a minoritized group. Right? Whereas descriptive representation is simply the presence of minoritized individuals in positions of power, be it in legislatures, in judiciaries. Right? But we make the case that coalition participation, even by ethnic minorities, doesn't necessarily have to be substantive. We can't automatically assume when an ethnic minority is in the legislature, let's say, that they will advocate and fight for minority interests. So that's our first contribution. The second contribution is the object of representation. Thus far, literature doesn't differentiate between which minority group, right? Does the political relevance, the mobilization, the size, right, or the level of marginalization faced by a minority group matter for the level of backlash that it evokes? 
And finally, we take on the subject advocating for representation. If we think the causal factor leading to radical right success is disruption of the status quo, why does it have to be an ethnic minority mobilizing for its own demands, right? That disrupts that status quo. We know that ethnic majorities take up minority interests when it benefits them electorally. We know that a lot of the advancements in minority rights in Central and Eastern Europe were propagated by the European Union, right? Or at least pressured by the European Union. So we think we need to focus outside of the realm of solely ethnic minority parties to understand this relationship. We also make an empirical contribution. We provide new causal evidence from two different countries where we test the effects of multiple different types of minority groups being represented. We test multiple different representers, right, the subjects actually advocating for minority representation. And we disentangle substantive versus descriptive representation. We extend existing observational analyses, right, so we, thus far, we, uh, Ushikova's original analysis was an aggregate level analysis focusing on the country election year, right, looking at vote returns for different parties. We shift the unit of analysis to the individual level, and we also replicate Ushikova's original analysis and extend the number of elections analyzed by about 33%. And most importantly, we provide a new continuous measure of substantive representation, which we call the ethnic power score. This measure, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, but to give you a brief overview, involves coding the ethnicity of every single cabinet minister in Central and Eastern Europe between 1990 and 2010, and also coding the prestige of their portfolio. And we believe that this gives us a much more accurate measure of substantive representation. We know which ministries the ethnic minorities held between 1990 and 2010, and we also know the amount of resources and power afforded to each of those ministries. And we believe that that is a much more accurate measure of substantive representation. So, starting with the survey experiments, we field them in Romania and Slovakia, two countries that have parallels in terms of their ethnic demography, right? Both have a sizable Hungarian minority, and both have a sizable Roma ethnic minority, which will be important once we get to the experiment. So here we answer four research questions. Does the representation of minority groups cause resentment? Does the minority group being represented matter? Does the actor behind representation matter? And does the type, type being descriptive versus substantive, of representation matter? We employ mixed factorial designs, which means that there are manipulations both within subjects and between subjects, right? And we do so with quota representative samples. We recruit over 1,500 respondents in Romania and over 800 respondents in Slovakia. The within manipulation concerns representation type and the actor behind representation. The between manipulation concerns the ethnic group being represented, Hungarian or Roma, in both Romania and Slovakia, and then the German minority in Romania. So this is the structure of the experiment, right? The dependent variable here is resentment, because that is the key outcome in this theory. Do majorities resent the representation of ethnic minorities? So, we ask all respondents, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? It bothers me when, in the control condition, a Romanian or Slovak becomes Minister of Development, Public Works, and Administration, right? So this is the ethnic hegemon, the ethnic majority, taking up the Ministry of Development, Public Works, and Administration. The name of the actual ministry was shifted between the two countries, right, to match reality. But this ministry was chosen because this is the position of the post that ethnic minorities often seek when they enter government coalitions because it gives them the uh, largest capacity to uh, allocate financial resources to minority regions, right? Since ethnic minorities in both countries, particularly the Hungarian minority, is regionally concentrated. In the within randomization, in a randomized order, we uh, ask participants about their resentment when a Hungarian, Roma, or German becomes Minister for Development, Public Works, and Administration. Right, so this is descriptive representation. Uh, an ethnic minority achieving a position within the cabinet. Substantive representation when a member of the ethnic majority, Romanian or Slovak, becomes Minister but allocates funding to the ethnic minority. And then descriptive plus substantive representation ethnic minority becoming minister and allocating funding to the ethnic minority 
right? So these are the within treatments, and the between treatments are the actual ethnic group being accommodated. So each respondent was only asked about Hungarians, only asked about Roma, or only asked about Germans, but they were asked all of these questions. And so the first thing we do is we pull the two samples and look at average treatment. So as you can see, right, zero isn't even on this plot, and that's because each of these three treatments had massive effects on resentment. First, we can look at descriptive representation, and we see that the descriptive representation of both groups, be they Hungarian or Roma, leads to resentment. But interestingly, we see that the descriptive representation of a political, of a politically mobilized minority, the Hungarians, versus a marginalized minority, the Roma, leads to more resentment. But when it comes to substantive representation, when substantive representation is added into the equation, we see the two groups evoke uh, higher levels of resentment. And again, the DV here is measured on a four-point scale, right? So we're looking at very big effects, hovering around one here. So in Romania, we added the Germans in as an ethnic group because the Hungarians are politically mobilized, the Roma are severely politically marginalized, so we wanted something in between. Right? an ethnic group that doesn't have its own political party, though the current Romanian president is a German, um, and is not heavily prejudiced. Right, No one actively discriminates or has high levels of prejudice against the German minority in Romania. And we see the results are consistent. Right, Even if we shift to Germans as the ethnic minority group being analyzed, resentment of their accommodation or of their representation uh, still occurs. And in Romania, we added two actors behind accommodation or representation. The European Union, right, as I talked about, the EU is a major driver, primarily now through financial resources of minority representation in Central and Eastern Europe, and then a Huawei, right, a Chinese multinational company. And here we see very similar results um, that we've seen thus far, right, the findings parallel one another. One interesting thing I will note is if you look at the EU treatment, we see that the EU accommodation or representation of Roma communities causes more resentment than the EU representation of Hungarian communities. And we believe that that's because it's a politically salient topic in the region, right? The far right constantly, since pretty much you know the early 2000s, has mobilized against EU support for Roma communities in Central and Eastern Europe. So that's why we believe we see the effect there. So takeaways, minority accommodation or representation, whether substantive or descriptive, causes resentment relative to the majority baseline. Yet, the substantive plus descriptive seems to cause the most resentment, right? Which makes sense, you're getting both types of representation. There's some evidence that the descriptive representation of politically mobilized ethnic minorities causes more resentment than the descriptive representation of marginalized ethnic minorities. And as I was just talking about, the EU representation of the Roma minority causes more resentment than the EU representation of the Hungarian ethnic minority. So we also conduct two observational analyses where we analyze uh, individual level survey data and aggregate level election returns to see if this relationship holds up across 17 different Central and Eastern European countries between 1990 and 2020. And as I was saying earlier, right, the primary motivation for this analysis is so we can properly disaggregate descriptive and substantive representation, right? And that's because even coalition participation can be token, right? Just because you sit in a coalition doesn't mean you're afforded access to power, right? It doesn't tell us how much access to power you're afforded to. And existing work also shows us that ethnic minority parties temper their policy demands and have less of a say in government decisions than ethnic majority parties. And substantive representation, as I've been talking about, can occur outside of the confines of ethnic minority parties, right? And we want to conceptualize substantive representation as a continuous concept, right? Not a binary one. It's not either that there is substantive representation or there is not. It's how much substantive representation is afforded to ethnic minorities. And so as I was saying, we calculate this ethnic power score, coding the prestige and um, position of all ethnic minorities in Central and Eastern European cabinets across 17 countries between 1990 and 2010, 2020. Sorry. Uh, the key idea that you have to, uh, the key takeaways from this measure are that we assign each portfolio a prestige, right? Ministry of Defense is more prestigious than the Ministry of Culture, unfortunately. Um, and we also assign each ministerial post uh, 
a value based on whether it is traditionally associated with ethnic minorities or if it's traditionally associated with ethnic majorities. So for example, it is more of a move towards representation when an ethnic minority gets the Ministry of Defense than when they get the Ministry of Ethnic Minority Affairs, right? Because we would expect the ministry to take the latter position, but not the former. And so I'll just highlight one result here. We basically run multi-level logit models, right, that uh, where the dependent variable takes on a value of one if a respondent votes for a radical right party, zero otherwise, and we look at three independent variables, ethnic minority party vote share, coalition participation, and the ethnic power score. And so as you can see, there is a statistically significant positive relationship between the ethnic power score, right, this measure that I was just talking about, and the predicted probability that a respondent <coughs> indicates that they would support a radical right party in parliamentary elections. So I'm almost out of time, right? And so the last thing I want to talk through are some implications. What this shows is that the representation of ethnic minority groups is a clear, though potentially currently latent, cause of radical right success, right? We've seen that radical right actors have picked new minorities to mobilize against, right? Um, but we still think this is relevant because many Central and Eastern European minorities, particularly Roma communities, remain in precarious, disadvantaged positions, right? So it should be a priority um, to achieve representation, right? And we also think that recent kind of developments in radical right mobilizations show us that this relationship would work very similarly when it comes to other minoritized groups, right? The ones I named at the outset of this presentation. We would expect to see a very similar backlash to when LGBTQ individuals are afforded uh, substantive representation in government cabinets, right? To when we see women represented in the highest levels of government. And so we think that this relationship also extends to other minoritized groups, right? The ones that currently make up the more novel targets of radical right mobilizations. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you to all four our, uh, of our speakers for keeping the time. I will be taking uh, questions in groups of three. Uh, starting with Ben, and please introduce yourself when you ask the question. I'm uh, Ben Stanley from SWPS University in Warsaw. My question is for Courtney, and it's um, this really interesting paper that uses um, the psychology literature to try to explore disgust and uh, discuss potential impacts on. Um, both on attitudes and actions. The thing that I wondered from the discussed rhetoric that you use in the experiment, we have, um, I'll just remind people of the, the slogans that we used. LGBT is pedophilia, LGBT is a rainbow plague, gay trash, get your hands away from children, homosexuals from around the world, get medical help. Um, the reason that I'm sort of drawing attention to this is because one thing that you show in the paper as well is that this rhetoric doesn't increase people's feeling of disgust towards LGBT people. And I think that one potential explanation for that might be that this isn't actually disgust rhetoric. That this is rhetoric that evokes um, negative sentiments, but um, which potentially doesn't necessarily have, uh, sort of, activate that, dis uh, that, that sense of disgust. Just to give one example here. <laughs> LGBT is paedophilia. This is a fairly straightforward claim that's been made by opponents of LGBT since from time immemorial in Poland. It might be that you simply that talking about this relationship is actually simply re reiterating a more generic negative attitude towards LGBT people. It's not necessarily evoking disgust, but rather simply intensifying negative feelings towards um, the, to, towards LGBT people. So I'd like to ask you if you could reflect on your, how convinced you are that the disgust rhetoric that you use is actually evoking disgust rather than some other form of negative attitude. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'm in the middle of the road. Uh, hi, this question for Gulnas. I have, well, question slash suggestion. Um, I'm wondering the extent to which you think of kind of this very interesting relationship between um, the Dutch far right and, and Dutch Muslims as something that's, that's a broader phenomenon. In other words, um, a broader 
type of behavior that we're seeing in, in um, uh, populist political movements in other countries. And the reason that I'm asking that is because I can think of one very strong parallel in the United States uh, between kind of what's happening with um, kind of the evolution of the, the U.S. Republican Party and Latinos in the United States. I was listening to a focus group the other day um, where Latinos were talking about kind of their feelings about wokeness. And this is a, a massive um, source of their um, ambivalence, uh, voting for, for Democratic candidates, and a strong kind of reason to vote for, um, for populist candidates. Thank you. Uh, here, sir. I will take one more in the first uh, in the first round, and if you, the shorter you keep the question, the more solid. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. So, um, if I'm disgusted at the beheading of babies and the vivisection of pregnant women, um, then I'm unfairly prejudiced against Hezbollah, the party of God, and Hamas. Um, that is a perfect, you laid out a perfect map for mind control. And uh, I gotta tell you, disgust is a human right. And you're wrong. Uh, okay. uh, thank you. I will take one more question. Uh, yeah. This is Sanni. I'm doing a postdoc here in Liberalism Studies program. Uh, short question for Roman. Um, thanks for the great work. Um, I'm just wondering. I remember uh, Matt Golder and some of the political scientists uh, at the PSU probably know that um, you know the increasing number in, in, increasing number of immigrants does not always kind of raise uh, the vote share of a right populist party, but only under a bad economic circumstance because increasing un unemployment or something. So might not. I mean, I guess it also, there's a huge possibility it may also apply to your uh, topic. Uh, you know, especially the ethnic majority or, you know, just majority people might be annoyed by increasing representation of minority, but even more so under when they're experiencing bad economic, you know, circumstances. Okay, uh, thank, you for the, thank you for the first round. Uh, if it's fine, I will do it in reverse order, so perhaps Courtney and Goulnes have uh, slightly more time, and I will start with the gentleman. Roman, please. I, you know, I think you are absolutely right, because this is very much a story about zero-sum competition over the size of the pie, right? This is a story about resources being limited, right, or finite, um, and the majority getting upset when their size shrinks, right? So I would expect that, um, yes, we could potentially look at the conditional relationship, right? So we have a control for economic volatility, right? Um, as well as individual unemployment, for example, but we could interact that, right? And see whether resentment um, is larger amongst those individuals who find themselves in precarious economic situations, right? Um, and, you know, I think it's it's interesting, right, uh, the Boulder work, right, and then the work of Raphael Densiger, right, who shows that it's not immigration itself, right, it's when immigrants in local communities start buying for more political power, right, so it really is about that size of the pie, and I think we can test for that in, in our models, so thank you for the suggestion. Thank you, and uh, I will move to Courtney, please. Hey, um, I'll start with, thank you so much for that question. Um, so the reason that I would consider the, these treatment um, statements to evoke disgust rhetoric is because um, disgust rhetoric is really about claiming that um, you know there is a group that is germy, it's decaying, it's toxic, it's noxious. Now the pedophilia one that might not fit here, right? But I think that the idea that um, people are, are trash, right? That trash is dirty, it's rotten, it's decaying. Um, and then the illness one, right, sick is germy. So in that sense, I think that it is discussed rhetoric. Um, I think it is odd <laughs> that um, discussed rhetoric isn't actually increasing people's um, perceptions of a group as disgusting. But what I think that's telling us is that discussed rhetoric might not work. It might not have the intended effect for people as a whole. There is a kind of positive effect between um, discussed rhetoric and feeling disgusted among homophobic people exclusively, um, and that's a very small effect, but it is positive. Um, so in that sense, I think that the discussed rhetoric is, is sort of kind of working on that 
um, homophobic group in the way that's expected. Um, so I, I perceive that as, as kind of being evidence um, that disgust rhetoric is evoking disgust, just not among people as a whole, because people overwhelmingly now or increasingly are not finding LGBT plus people to be disgusting. Um, I am, though, currently in the process of creating a protest event data set that looks at um, the places in Poland that have had um, anti-LGBT or these LGBT free zones, um, and then mapping where there are pro and anti-LGBTQ plus protests to see if the places that pass these resolutions that sometimes do and sometimes don't evoke discussion rhetoric have different protest patterns like in the real world. Um, so I think that sort of analysis might help me get to that question a little bit later. Um, Peter, um, I'm not saying that people can't have a reaction to a stimulus. Um, yeah, I think that emotions, right, are not something that can necessarily be controlled all the time. Um, and I think that the different sorts of effects that I'm seeing in terms of the different emotions that discussed rhetoric um, creates amongst people um, suggests that there are a lot of different reactions to the same sorts of rhetoric. Thank you, Courtney. Kulmas, please. Yes, uh, I will respond really to Jack's question. Um, I was thinking about doing broader parallels also throughout Europe. Of course, with France, that will be the easiest. Uh, with you know, national fronts, with Zimur coming in, being on the very right, it also pushes a national front more to the center right, and they start also changing their attitudes in the Muslim communities, also to you know to attract them. So I think there's a lot of countries on like Western Europe that you could I think draw similar parallels. But the one with the Latino group, I think this is very, very, really good suggestion. I never thought about this, and just while you know others are responding, on, mm, is that does it really work? Um, because I think there is a bit of a difference that in the US we talk about race, so I think the Latino group is very much other based on race. Um, whereas in Europe, I think racialization still happens in terms of like religion, civilization. But I think in terms of like the other being the other, I think there is very comparable. Uh, process that are going on, that the other is now all of a sudden becomes interesting in order to gain support and use them as this voter space. And I think in both cases what is interesting that they, although Muslims are presented having agency because they sort of vote for those parties, but still what you do see is that most of the time, you know, they're still secondary or they, they use, they pulled in, so it's also not entirely, you know, equal collaboration, so there's always still a hierarchy, and I think in the US it's also very similar that, you know, although they appeal to, it still doesn't mean that they will get the agency or the voice, you know, to, to articulate their grievances. So in that sense, I think a lot of things. Thank you. Second round. Yes. Hello. Um, so I'm Jessica Lopez. I'm a question for Dr. March. Uh, I was wondering about I guess some of the background assumptions um, for the study in the sense of, we're all familiar with the iron law of oligarchy for organizations and groups, the, the Mitchell's idea that even uh, disparate and inchoate groups end up forming hierarchies, right? Um, they might be led by a single leader or an oligarchy of sorts. Uh, are there any successful movement parties of long-standing duration in, in measured in decades that maintain this decentralized anti-party approach? Or should we assume that there's always a trajectory towards hierarchy and greater organizational complexity over time, with perhaps the only exception being authoritarian, charismatic, populist style internal organizations? So I guess, what is our, what is our assumption about party democracy, or what that means, or party decentralization, or liquid democracy, um, based on predecessor cases? Uh, I have, yes, in the back, in a greenish yellow. Uh, hi, this question is for uh, Luke March. So, what, more, more of a comment to, uh, I think the case in Mexico of uh, Morena would be a very interesting case to add to your comparison. Um, it's interesting to, I know, I mean, I from Mexico, I did a research of the PRI and how Lopez Obrador you know, to, doesn't reproduce the structure of the PRI, but it's still a social movement. I mean, the interesting thing about his election is that it destroyed the party system in Mexico. And by, I mean, the three main competing parties really became not viable anymore. And so I think it would be interesting to frame your analysis on what it means in these, you know, populist moments 
where really you still have democracy, they still care about the elections, but the system of representation and part of it, which is the political, the traditional political parties, don't work anymore. And so how, but it's interesting also that Lopez Obrador again is trying to reveal his own structure, but in a very different way, I mean, using the same politics of the PRI, but very different from what the PRI represented, because even though when Mexico was authoritarian, there was some pluralism within the political party. The PRI represented different movements within the party, whereas his social movement doesn't represent any specific sector of society as the PRI used to. So I think it's also interesting to see this transition between these traditional parties that do represent certain types of interest and structures versus these movements that really just coalesce around this leader, and but how they break the the elements of representative democracy. So I think I, if you if you can expand more about it in the cases that you studied, thank you. Uh, thank you. In the middle of uh, in the middle of the second row, please. Great. Thanks, um, Hill Zabotkin for University of Berlin. I have one question for Gulnaz and one for Courtney. So Gulnaz. Uh, I think your research is super fascinating, and I want to kind of push you a little bit to think about, you know, so traditionalist Muslims, so kind of conservative oriented, um, whom do they tend to vote for generally? Because I was struck by the fact that, I mean, the far right aren't kind of the obvious choice, right? I mean, the center right would be probably more obvious choice. Um, and I think suggest that maybe one can think about kind of the different dimensions that these this group makes their choice based on, particularly thinking about the difference between kind of traditionalism and nativism, right? Because the problem is that the far right, they are both traditionalist and nativist. So traditionalism, conservative Muslims are totally okay with, but nativism is the problem, right? Because the far right that are nativists, they really hate Muslims, to put it very bluntly, right? That's the problem. Um, but then again, if they would drop the nativist part, it would be okay, right? And that's what the center right could. Yes, and then a question to Courtney. So your research finds that the disgust rhetoric a little bit increases the protest of anti-LGBTQ, but it actually causes more kind of protest of pro-LGBTQ. But what do you think? Does it mean that the homophobic movements are basically wrong? to use disgust rhetoric, or, so, or is, is there some kind of other purpose that they used? I especially wonder whether it's bad for them that there are more pro-LGBTQ protests. Is it bad, or is it then something they can point to and say, look, our opponents are so strong, we should be even stronger, we should mobilize, something like that. Okay, uh, thank you. This was the final question. I now give uh, the floor to Luke, Kulnas, and Courtney to answer. Okay, thanks for those questions. I'll try and be as brief as possible, whereas those questions certainly deserve a longer answer. Um, thanks for the point about the um, theoretical assumptions. I, th I think that tends to be my assumption through working in such organizations and through um, <laughs> like the, the organizations such as universities, for example. But the, um, the literature does allow for another outcome at least the literal movement parties, it, asked, it allows for either organizational um, hierarchization or some kind of breakdown between party and movement and some reformation of the party system, um, which would lead into the second question as well. I am unaware of the movement parties as such as, as, list, as lasting uh, beyond more, um, and, and maybe I could be corrected on this, but uh, beyond more than two or three electoral cycles where they become something else and as you say we can identify populist parties parties in uh, fluid party systems where there are those tendencies but even then they tend to um, they tend to change according to personality and the, and the labels and it's actually very difficult to identify such organizational hierarchy one thing where we might be able to identify it and something worth looking at is where it exists in the kind of founding moment moment of political parties and it's something which uh, the, the movement ethos can be dormant and then can be re recapitulated and we've had a perfect example of that in the Labour Party in Britain where it's, its status as the organisational expression, the parliamentary expression of the workers movement was something that, that Corbyn came back to and said well 
of how are we going to bring this in, into account? And it was very much about a recapitulation of, and refoundation of the history. And it clearly didn't last. Um, I would just, uh, my answer to the second question, again, is encapsulated past, partly in the, in the answer to the first in terms of, yeah, those Latin American examples are, are, are very useful. Uh, it's something that, that we should look at. I would, I would say also that obviously the theory of populism is, is, um, is, is follows very much, um, as you all well know, it's taken from the Latin American examples. But it doesn't work, and this is something where I would have an issue with a lot of the stuff that's been written on it. It doesn't work in the European context. It just doesn't. It, 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 it can serve some functions for a political party uh, in terms of um, expanding its electorate, rejuvenating its, its image, making it appeal to more effective things like the nation, um, encapsulate um, and kind of anti-party rhetoric. But unless you have a fundamental breakdown of the party system, um, which in most European countries is a long-term phenomenon, uh, uh, then you are not going to have that space to unite yeah. the, the people against the elite. You're just not going to do it. And that's why we've seen that, I, I think Francis de will go that way, uh, Podemos is in a um, in a union called Sumar, which I think my Spanish is addition. It's actually subtraction. It's it's, it's a diminishing diminishing return. So um, I think there are there are fundamental things about the um, about the theory and its translatability to uh, party systems where particularly social democratic parties manage to recover and. The next Greek election, we may see the um, PASOK overtake uh, Syriza again. So the old, older parties and the older organizations will reassert themselves over the populists. Uh, but your point taken, and it's, uh, it's a good example. Yeah, and, and in Italy, it's an exception. Mm -hmm. There was a breakdown of the political system. That's why Italy is such a, a good you know, case study. Yeah, it didn't help the radical left. Exactly. It helped other, other particular yeah, yeah, yeah. examples. Yeah, good. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Goodness, please. Thank you so much for your question, and definitely way more research is needed. Just a quick point uh, with regards to the, like, indeed, the far right is not the most logical case, but I think there's something to do also with the left changing. Because it used to be the central left that attracted the migrant Muslim voters, but now as they move more from class issues to more, you know, culture, gender aspect, then they lose you know, the voter base. And then the Muslim community seeks for something, something new. Um, what is interesting with the case that I presented, uh, although I totally agree that traditional awards, but it doesn't, with Baudet, I mean, he was unspoken in nature this, and he didn't even try to hide this uh, because of his YouTube videos. I mean, as I gave the example, he said, I'm Dutch, you are not Dutch, although the, the person was born in the Netherlands. Um, but apparently, even that is not, uh, you know, appalling the potential voters because maybe there was something like a hierarchy of interests, and in this case, it's better to work with a native who speaks openly against LGBTQ and the state. And then it's like, you know, later you will deal with the na nativist aspect. Uh, but somehow it's strangely enough, even that is still considered to be okay. And that I think we need to look into the communities that vote. Because my assumption is that Muslim identity doesn't play a bigger role either. So I think in terms of identity, there is also a hierarchy that is a bit of easier. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kurt, thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, so starting off with, the, is it bad for anti-LGBTQ plus protest organizers? Is there more pro-LGBTQ plus protests? Like, can they use this as a way to mobilize more people? Um, based on some qualitative work of semi-structured interviews that I've done with anti-LGBTQ plus activists, um, they do seem to think it works. Um, my assumption would also be that uh, these anti-LGBTQ plus movement organizers would prefer to have more people in their camp than against it more resources, et cetera. Um, so I do think, and you can answer the question of, does this mean these homophobic movements are wrong? Um, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, two parts of my dissertation look at um, the types of cues and, and pressures to protest that anti-abortion and anti-LGBTQ plus activists use. Um, in both cases, I uh, interview activists, um, kind of lay out some of the strategies that they discuss using. Um, I then pair it with survey experiments, and I find that in both cases, they're not mobilizing people when they think that they are. Um, so these, this queuing just doesn't really work a lot of the time. Um, but that said, I think there are other purposes for using this discussed rhetoric. So discussed rhetoric um, dehumanizes people, 
like obviously right um, and when people um, are dehumanized in this way it can increase people's willingness to um, endorse violence against them um, or take these other non-normative actions so um, another article that I have um, that I'm working on right now looks at how this discussed rhetoric against LGBTQ plus people um, shapes people's willingness to um, accept violence against LGBTQ plus people. And I find that homophobic people who are exposed to this discussed rhetoric um, are more tolerant of violence against LGBTQ plus people. So even if it's not mobilizing them to protest, it does have these other really negative pernicious effects. Thank you so much. I would like uh, uh, to ask you to thank with me Luke, Golnas, Courtney, and Roman. And the coffee is uh, all yours.